Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm glad I came in early to hear that. So that's, uh, it's a joy to have, uh, to hear a beautiful prelude like that as we gather together to worship our Lord and Savior. So uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Praise the Lord. Let us rejoice and be glad in it because we are gathered here on Zoom and YouTube later on in the day and here together personally uh, in, in person to praise and worship and glorify our risen Lord. So I want, to wel I want to welcome each and every one of you. I know we have announcements, so we don't have announcements. Okay, there's no announcements. I know there is a chat or a snack and chat after worship today. So please, everyone, stay, stay around. We have a, a time of fellowship and a time of just enjoying each other. And I now see Doreen is going to make an announcement. Go ahead. The ladies from Lyft are going to go to lunch next Wednesday at 1130. So let me know if you want to come. Okay, so it's this coming Wednesday? No, next, next week, the 23rd. Okay, a week from this Wednesday, the women of Lyft, uh, uh, ladies in fellowship together, will be having lunch. And please contact Doreen for information. Thank you. Super. Thanks. Any other uh, announcements? Any joys and concerns that we have to lift up? Me again. <laughs> it's me. Uh, my friend Isabel passed away last week, so we pray for her family. Okay. Definitely. Will. And, um, uh, my sister-in-law, Judy, is in the hospital. Uh, my brother's wife, she had to have part of her toe amputated, but she's doing very well, so we pray for her, please. Thank you. Her name was Judy? Okay. I just think we all ought to shout out a thanks for all the soup makers last week. Thanks all the soup. soups were very good. Yeah, that was successful. Thank you. That soup was fantastic. Any others? Yes, Tom. Uh, my brother passed away yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he, he, he had liver cancer, and uh, they, they just couldn't do anything for it. And, but he passed away peacefully, so that was good. Thank you for sharing that with us, Tom. Any other joints concern, Keith? Yeah, um, Friday I last I worked my last day, and I joined the ranks of retired, so I'm looking forward to the next phase of my life. You do realize, Keith, saying that in the middle of a worship service when we need elders and deacons, almost uh, that uh, okay, okay, you you put it out there. Praise the Lord. Congratulations. Any other joys and concerns? I will admit that I'm surprised at how many people we have in worship today because with the snow yesterday and the losing an hour of sleep today, I don't know, I was wondering. And even the clock here says it's only 9.05, so I've got, what, an hour plus to preach. So until that says, until that says 11, I'm going. Okay, so, but yeah, please stay for our uh, snack and chat later. We thank you uh, for all the people that gather together in person and on Zoom as we continue to seek to praise and glorify the Lord. So let us now center ourselves in the worship of God.
Good morning. Good morning. Let us join together in our responsive call to worship. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. For I find delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Let us worship God. Let us go to God in unison and ask for his mercy and grace. Lord of everlasting life, we thank you for the realization that you have given us eternal life and that we will be counted among the saints surrounding the throne, giving you glory for all eternity. Forgive us when we live our lives as if wrongdoing and sin are fun while faithfulness and righteousness is boring. Inflame us with your Holy Spirit so that we see that we live in the shadows of joy until we stand before you and know what true joy is. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Christian friends, too often we think that the world, the, the world out there, the second world is all sorts of fun, but the world in here is kind of a drag, a little boring. 
But this is where true joy resides until we stand before the even more true joy of standing before the throne. And in order to get there, we sin, but God changes our hearts so that we can turn back and walk towards him in righteousness. So hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let's remain standing and affirm what we believe by sharing together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray that God will open our hearts and minds. Lord God Almighty, we know that true understanding only comes through you and the power of the Holy Spirit. Give us the knowledge that we need to hear and know your word, both, both read and proclaimed. Let it at all times lead us closer to your Son and the ability to share him with the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our first reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. May the Lord bless this reading and our understanding of his most holy word. Good morning. How many of you like gospel music? Let me see a show of hands if you like gospel music. All right, well this one I thought this morning was just for some, some fun. I found this group, uh, Redeemed Quartet, and uh, they're just like a fun group to listen to. So most of you know this song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. So it doesn't have the lyrics on here, but if you know this song, go ahead and sing along. I just thought uh, some of you may really like the bass in this quartet. So hopefully this will just be, bring a smile to your face this morning. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting what a peace is my leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, I'm leaning, leaning, I'm leaning safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning, I'm leaning, leaning, I'm leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Sweet. 
to walk in this pilgrim way Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, I'm leaning, leaning I'm leaning safe and secure from all One day asked me to tell you about my Gaither story, right Holly? <laughs> our scripture today comes from, again, and I don't often do this, but I know our passage, our first passage was John, John chapter 10, and here we continue in it because it has a theme in it that we definitely want to talk about, and we see it in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 26. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. This is important. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I gave, I gave, I came from you, and they have believed all that, they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them have been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for the sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for, those, for these only, but also for those who will believe in me throughout the through your their word, but that they may, may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, and they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name. I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is 
can be a very difficult passage because the I and me and you and me and we and them and us and one and all that can all get a little confusing. But it really comes down to it's talking about life everlasting and about what Jesus came to do and that he's near the end of his uh, earthly ministry and he is about to ascend into, uh, about to be, to be uh, crucified, dead, and resurrected, and then to ascend. And so you know what the progression of what's coming. And this is what's called the high priestly prayer. But it really comes down to Jesus telling us in this passage that before the foundation of the earth, God in Christ has chosen us for everlasting life so that we no longer, uh, no longer need to live in doubt and worry, but in the confidence and the assurance that we have eternal life through Jesus, guaranteed by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, saying that can seem, okay, what does that mean? Well, it really comes down to our concept of heaven. What, what is heaven? Now, I know everyone has a picture in their mind of what heaven is. Now, some might think it's just the same old, same old, but a little bit different. It's going to be just like this, except without the unfun and boring stuff. We're going to be with everyone we want to be with. We don't need to retire because we don't need to work. It's just going to be fun, 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 until our daddy take our T-bird away. I don't know. Because it's going to be this awesome, super fantastic forever party. Now, I don't know how many people actually have that in their head, but I'd be surprised if at least one, two, or maybe a lot in this congregation don't have some version of that. And if it's not that, it is something else that has a, that's a, so, somewhat akin. It's like, are there dogs in heaven? I've been asked that. Are there dogs in heaven? I don't know. But I know there are people who say, if there are no dogs in heaven, then when I die, I want to go where those, the dogs are, not in heaven. Because how, how would heaven be heaven without dogs? But if we get serious, what is heaven all about? It's about our concept of everlasting life. It's about our concept of immortality. Now, I love that there's a lot of great things out there about immortality. This woman named Martha Lavinia Hoffman, I don't know who she is, but I like this quote, life is, life is the root of Eden's loftiest tree whose ripened fruit is immortality. That sounds nice. And then, of course, we can't do anything unless we have Bruce Lee to tell us what immortality is because he says the key to immortality is, is first living a life worth remembering. That's nice. And then we all like poets, don't we? So Emily Dixon, because I could not suffer death, he kindly suffered me, the carriage held but just ourselves at immortality. Of all the three, I think that's the one I like the most. Um, not that I'm a big poem person, but that sounds nice. And we can't forget what's in, well, we have to ask ourselves, is there a difference between eternal existence, immortality, and eternal life? That's a really important understanding. So we go to Moses 1, 39. For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the, immort the immortality and eternal life of man. Wait a minute. Did anyone think, what? Moses 1, 39? Where is that in Scripture? It's not in Scripture. It's the Book of Mormons. We ain't Mormons, so we really shouldn't be listening to that. But what does Scripture say? It says in 1 Timothy 6, 14 through 16, and you can verify it if you pick up a Bible, and I'm not tricking you anymore. It says from the, about the Lord Jesus Christ, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of Lord, Lord of lords, who alone, hear this, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Yeah, that's why we're not Mormons. Because immortality is about quality, a quantity. Eternal life is about quality. 
I love this, uh, this metaphor. Immortality is about how long the dinner lasts. Eternal life is what is on the menu and who is with us at the table. Only God in Christ is immortal. Who was, who is, who is to come. There is no, there is no limit to who God in Christ is. Uh, there's no beginning, there's no end. God is God and we are not. So what's the point of us talking about immortality? Really, there's no point in that, but there is a, certainly a point in talking about everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We hear that in the very beginning of the Gospel of John, that we know that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have everlasting life. So what is it? We say it almost every week in the Apostles' Creed. Whenever we say the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in the life everlasting. So that calls into question, what is the life everlasting? And that calls into question, so is that our chief end? To achieve and look for that everlasting life? Now, I don't want anyone to say the answer. I know some of you know these, that, the answer to this question. It comes from the uh, first question in the Shorter Catechism and in the Larger Catechism of the Westminster Co Confession of Faith. But we'll put a pin in that and come back to that later. So let's read what Scripture says, because that's really the point. It's not my opinion. It's not what I think. It's not even the quotes I pull in for whatever source. It's what Scripture says. So... We see it at the very beginning of our passage. Now, I'm not going for a verse-for-verse -verse, uh, exposition of the passage. In all seriousness, I am going to try to get done around, uh, around 11. But I'm going to pick, because of this, the difficulty of these passages, I'm going to pick some of the main points out. And the first one is when Jesus says, this is eternal life. Remember I emphasized that? To know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. This is eternal life. To know God and to know Christ. That's eternal life. Jesus himself tells us that. Now that might need a little more explanation, and that's fine. But part of that question is, how do we feel that if we have eternal life? It says, Paul says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is one of the reasons I love being Presbyterian, the whole the providence and predestination thing. Now, we know because we are here seeking Jesus, seeking to know about Jesus, even if we're not absolutely sure, convinced, is if our minds are drawn to Christ, our minds are drawn to God, that we know it's only drawn by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we can have the assurance that we are saved. And then through that assurance that we are saved, the assurance of eternal life. So that really calls into question, what are we expecting? What are we expecting when we get there, when we have eternal life? I'm here today, we talked about some people. We talked about Vernon. We talked about Isabel. Two people that have passed. What, are they, what were they expecting? Now, if you like C.S. Lewis, he expounded on this in, his, in several different ways. One, in very serious theological books, and others in the Chronicles of Narnia. And in the very last book called The Last Battle, he uses this concept. He says, you know, people die, and then when, once they understand their death, what happens? Do they stay where they are in death? Or do they go further up and further in? Do they seek that relationship with God? Because that's the point, to get there further up and further in, to stand in relationship with God. Jesus continues to say, I have revealed to you those whom you gave me. He's, he's talking to God in this prayer. Who gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they've obeyed your word. Now in some ways he's taught, well, and, and he's really right now talking about the 12. Or, oops, the 11. He's talking that you gave these 11 people to me. 
And it really was more than 11 because he had given them a bunch of people. We see when they go to the upper room after his uh, death, resurrection, and ascension, and they're waiting. There's a, there's a lot of people in that upper room. It's just not 11 folks. And, but however many people are in that room, that is the sheep. That is the sheep of his flock. God gave them to Jesus. They heard the word, and they became his flock. Because they heard the word and they started handling the word. And we see at least two examples in scripture where they go out two by two, just the 11 or the 12, and then uh, later on the 70. So they go out two by two sharing the words. So he continues, for I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. What are we absolutely certain about? April 15th is coming, so we know taxes is one thing. The other thing would be the common saying, death and taxes. Those are the two certainties of life, death and taxes. But in all seriousness, what are we absolutely certain? Billy Graham says the hope we have in Christ is an absolute certainty. We can be sure that the place Christ is preparing for us will be ready when we arrive because with him nothing is left to chance. Everything he promised, he will deliver. Now, who doesn't like Billy Graham? Of course, we all do. Solid, stout Christian, proclaiming God's word throughout his entire life. He had the certainty. Do we have the certainty? We should. The promise has been made. Jesus keeps his promises, so why aren't we certain, or are we certain, about where we're going and what we're going to be doing? Jesus continues, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. That gives me, again, a wonderful a, a, a reassurance that Jesus himself will uphold us with his righteous right hand. He's not going to let us go. He's not going to forget about us. He's not going to take a nap and say, oh, when he wakes up, I wonder where this person is. He knows us completely. Because he has a plan for us, just as God has a plan for us. And all of that is part of God's plan. We might question it. We might wonder, what is this really all part of God's plan? Is, we're, are we really in it? But God has a plan that he will not move away from. And that plan is for our welfare, not for our destruction. Now he says again, I've given them your word, and the, word has, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Imagine that we're given a word of hope and then suddenly we find out we're hated because we hold on to that hope. And haters are haters. When they see you walk on water, they'll say it's because you can't swim. They're always looking for the reason to hate on you, to despise you, to look down upon you. No matter what we do, in Christ, it's always in Christ, there will be those who will hate us for doing it, even if it's good. We see that again and again, and we're seeing it more closer to home. Christians are being arrested and persecuted in Canada for proclaiming the word. Canada. Mexico. On both sides of the border, Christians are being persecuted, killed, and arrested because they're proclaiming God's word. To what degree is that happening in the United States? Obviously not overtly, but if you want to make a joke at someone's expense, make it about a Christian. Not many people are going to come to our defense. But instead of rebelling and lashing out, we're called to have the same attitude as Christ does. To have that same attitude. Now, I, I love when I read this. It says of 100 unsaved people, 
One might read the Bible, but the other 99 will read the Christian. Meaning what? They're going to say, okay, the Bible, oh, okay, oh I'm, I'm, praise the Lord, I believe. But most of them, before they even pick up that Bible, are going to be looking at the people that call themselves Christians and say, is that something I want to emulate? Is that something I want to model myself after? And so what that means is wherever we go, whatever we do, if we say in one instance we're a Christian, people are going to be looking at us for the consistency and the continuity of what they believe Scripture says. And I've been, I've been surprised how non-Christians know Scripture better than most Christians. So we better know what Scripture says. And that's what Jesus is saying. I'm giving you the word and they know the word. So Jesus goes on to say, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one, that they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So I know they're not, they don't belong to this world, as I have not belonged to this world. I'm not asking you to take them out. Don't bring them along with me yet. They got a mission. They got a purpose. They've got a, a, a job. And so I will pray for them and pray that they are kept out of the hands of the evil one. Great. But also, they've got, as I said, they have a job. They're in the world, but not of the world, but they're sent to the world. C.S. Lewis, right in the time of World War II, likened it to a beachhead. Christians go to that beachhead and they set up a, a, a front that they keep on pushing until they overcome the darkness. That is our job. Our job is not to be in the world, or to be of the world, to do what the world says and what the world wants, but we're to be in the world doing what God and Christ wants. That is our job. And he continues to say, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundations of the world. So we know that though he's saying not today or tomorrow, but someday. For Isabel and for Vernon it was recently. And we are sad for their families, but we should be joyful for them because they are now with God in Christ. Because they have concluded their journey. One of my favorite books is A Pilgrim's Progress because it talks about that Christian journey from the time we understand who Jesus Christ is till we stand at the foot of the cross, release the burden of our sins, and now as we progress to the end, Stopping and starting and messing up, of course, along the way. But we will get to the end. Vernon and Isabel have gotten to the end. They've stood before the throne. They have been glorified in Christ. We are joyful for them. We look for that same thing for ourselves. But until then, one step in front of the other. Because we know that God in Christ has chosen us before the foundations of the world. That we, that, so that we will be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. Before the foundation of the world, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. He has claimed us just as he has proclaimed his son. And so just like his son, we are called to do his will. He continues to say, Righteous Father, through the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And this I myself may be in them is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because God knows us. And we, he knows us as his. He doesn't say, oh yeah, I know that guy. He says, oh, I know my son. I know her. No, I know my daughter. Just as our mothers and fathers know us, God knows us even more. 
even deeper, even better. And that can be hard to conceive because we know mom and dad knows us real well. How much more would God know us then? He doesn't just know us. He knows everything about us. The things that turn our heart, the things that uplift our spirit, the things that we are tempted by, and the things that we fall and fail at. And yet he still loves us. We're told you are not meant for hiding, you are meant for highlighting the one who created you, call you by name, and invite you out of the shadows into the light of his love. That is what our purpose is. That is where we should be going. That is eternal life. Life today and life tomorrow. Life everlasting. To highlight the one who created us, the one who calls us by name, by name and invites us out of the shadow and into his light of his love. C.S. Lewis, again, uses that whole concept of further and further up, but he also uses the concept of shadowlands, that we are in a shadow of what true joy is, that the day will come when we will stand before the throne in the fullness of what joy is all about. Because even though we glorify God here and now, our glorification of God is nothing compared to the glory of God when we stand before him. But we are united with Christians around the world. We're one in the Spirit. We're one in the Lord. And so we should always seek for that unity so that people will know that we are Christians by our loves, by the love we have not only for each other but for them. And that is why we share God's word. Eternal life is not about what we get, but about what we are called to give now and later. It is our purpose. It is our purpose to glorify God. So let's answer the question, what is the chief end of man? What is our purpose? Our chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We do it here now in the shadows to a degree. Because we can't do it in fullness until we stand before the throne. Until we go further in and further up until we stand before the throne and God has glorified us as he has promised. So the purpose of life, life now and life everlasting is to glorify God. Are we fulfilling our purpose? Is this, is, is this what we believe? So when we say, I believe in everlasting life, or the life everlasting, that should be our mind. I believe in, the ever, in life everlasting that gives me opportunity now, tomorrow, and the next day, and until even after I, we pass, to stand before the throne to glorify him for all eternity. That is our purpose. Christian friends, let us live out our purpose each and every day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we lift you up in all things. We ask your blessings on us. We thank you so much for the life of Isabel and Vernon, for Britain's friend who passed, for the LeMay family, uh, the son of the, of the LeMay family, Brandon, who died of a heart attack at only 42, for the family of John Gaber, Lord, we know that they are now before you in your will with all the saints proclaiming joy and being in your presence. They have truly come to the fulfillment and the continuation of what life everlasting is. Lord, let us look to that. Let us put aside some of the secular ideas of what heaven is about. And let us embrace what you call us to believe. Lord, we ask your blessing to be with Cindy Hawk's brother, Bill, 
who is still struggling with the fear of pan uh, pancreatic cancer returning. Be with Donna Carney as she continues to take infusions, and we rejoice that she's doing better. With Sil Sylvia Saycatch's son-in-law, Dan, who's having a cornea transplant, and with Dan Cork's mom, who was hit by a car but is doing better, alleviate whatever fear she may be having about that. With Bill Maloney and uh, Judy Butler. With Lori's mom, Claire. With Joyce's sister, Cheryl. Be with Bernie Hollis and Pearl Montgomery and Janet Federkel, who all have one degree or another of back pain. Let their pain subside and let them feel better. We rejoice that Keith Lowe is uh, retired now. Let him enjoy this time. Be with uh, Patty's uh, sister, Linda, and her husband, Tom, as Tom is uh, struggling through pancreatic cancer as well, and Linda is seeking to support him. Be with Finley Rose, who was born 2.8 pounds, whose mother had a heart attack, and it's through the heart attack found out she was pregnant, but who's been born and is beginning to thrive and be with Judy, Doreen's sister. And Lord, we just thank you so much for the soup we had last week and for the hands that made it. And finally, Lord, be with the Ukrainian people, be with their president and government, be with the, the Russian people, and open the hearts of the, their president and government to change and to withdraw and to bring peace back into the region. Lord, we ask your blessings to be with us. We thank you for the love you have for us. And we seek to fulfill the purpose that you have set before us. We love you and ask you to be with us as we pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christian friends, it's right and proper that God has given us so much that we return a proper portion to him. We have offering baskets in the back, so as you came in, you could leave your offerings. And we thank you for those who did. As you leave, you can leave your offerings in those baskets. And for those on YouTube and on Zoom, you please, we'd ask you to send your offerings in. So we can continue to do the ministry God has called us, to glorify his name, to show the world in whom we believe, and to share with them the joy of that belief that they too can have once they believe in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Lord, bless these gifts, bless us as your people, and let us continue to serve you in all that we say and do. We ask all this in your son's, uh, son's name. Amen.
Christian friends, I again invite you to stay for our uh, snack and chat and just have a, a great time of fellowship. And we'll pray for the food now and then the benediction. Dear Lord, we ask your blessings on the food, the blessings on the fellowship. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for your love. Let us also, Lord, look out into the world of where you call us to go, what you call us to be. Let us look to the life everlasting that's not happening tomorrow or when we die, but happening today to glorify you, to enjoy you, and to share you with the world. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of God's Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us now and always. Amen.